And Mr. Dietz, Dr. Dietz is the director of the Purdue Homeland Security Institute and a professor in the Computer and Information Technology Department at Purdue University. He's on loan from Purdue to the state from 2005 to 2008. He's, he was the founding executive director for the Indiana Department of Homeland Security, a new cabinet level department in Indiana that included over 300 public safety employees. Retiring as a lieutenant colonel from the U.S. Army in 2004, Dr. Dietz led Army research and acquisition programs including chemical weapons detectors, command and control software, communications prototypes, and Army power systems, and was the initial cadre of uniformed Army scientists and engineers. An Indiana native, Eric was graduated from, in 1984 from Rose Holman Institute of Technology after earning a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering. He also earned a Master's of Science from Rose Holman Institute of Technology in 1986 and a PhD in Chemical Engineering in 1994 from Purdue University. It's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Dietz for this morning. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I guess my daughter's here, but my mom's not, so we, we probably could have gone with a much shorter version. Certainly, I think my daughter would approve. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Homeland Security as we've taken it on at Purdue, and specifically, we, uh, there's been a lot of discussion on cybersecurity, and I'm going to focus more at the interface of the cyber physical security on the physical security side. Clearly, I come to uh, this field from the physical security side, from the military uh, background. I never thought I was going to be doing Homeland Security after I retired from the military. As it turns out, the Army perfectly trained me for something none of us knew we needed to have done at the time. First half of my career, I worked with uh, weapons of mass destruction, detectors, and so on. In the last half of my career, after I got a PhD, the Army said, we don't need you to do chemical work anymore, but we do want you to do um, you know, command and control work, which essentially became the hardware, the software, all the systems that built uh, the automated battle command systems and the automation systems that we used in the battlefield. When I got to Purdue, working Homeland Security, we really started to look at this problem a bit differently. Some of the workforce issues that were talked about, we thought about, do we need a new cybersecurity? Do we need a fit Homeland Security program? And we basically came to the conclusion that what we needed is a bolt-on program that could go kind of like a minor for a graduate degree uh, to you know, help the engineers, the school teachers, the veterinarians, the disciplines across Purdue uh, start worrying about Homeland Security. So we've, we've got an institute at Purdue that was put together uh, by our Purdue president right after 9-11. The, the institute basically has a mission of managing and uh, building interdisciplinary research. So many of the problems we've talked about or we've you know, been discussed so far are, are discussing those interdisciplinary problems, those things that evade the stovepipes. And, and that's where Purdue has got an entire part of our university that uh, basically blasts the stovepipes apart and works laterally. So, you know, it's very clear on a, on a university campus, there's a chemistry department, there's a physics department. There's this interdisciplinary part of the Purdue campus called Discovery Park, which our Homeland Security is part of. We're able to reach out to over 2,200 faculty and basically pursue uh, research a, a, across uh, as we see fit in those missions. I've focused on three main areas. How do we measure Homeland Security? So I would say, uh, you know, a lot of what I do is about how do we build a yardstick and figure out how we measure it. We can, as academics and scientists, argue about do we have the right yardstick, and we can do that as we evolve, as threats evolve, as risks and threats evolve. But with a yardstick, we can actually start to treat this problem like an engineering problem, these security problems. Second is health response to disaster. Never seen a disaster, never seen an emergency that it didn't involve some way, shape, or form the healthcare system. Even our healthcare system might be, you know, on its own a disaster. Uh, you know that you know we could have a whole nother, uh, you know, session and uh, other scientists talking about. And last is energy security. But I'm going to focus on some of the projects we did here today. We've also got several homeland security courses that were developed. It, again, is this sort of interdisciplinary set of courses where we've had everybody from engineers to nurses that take these classes. We have fundamentals classes. We have resource management classes. Uh, this summer, we're actually, uh, for the last about eight years, we've taught a, a summer class either at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Indianapolis Pacers, and this year we're working with our health department to try to run a large event security exercise around a class in the summer. As it turns out, students work incredibly hard and incredibly cheap, 
and we've managed to be able to help a lot of, uh, a lot of our partners in the state. Clearly, a, an event like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway that attracts nearly half a million visitors um, you know, has, has security issues as a, as a large one-day event. We've also uh, got several seminar classes that uh, work in modeling and simulation that, of the projects that I'll show you here. You see, again, these research areas are measuring of homeland security, uh, the disaster, health response to disaster, energy security, and finally some veterans programs that I'll mention uh, in brief at the end. Um, some recent uh, projects that we've got, I'm gonna run through each of these. A couple that are presented here at this meeting are in the other research, the just-in-time training uh, for Homeland Security Preparedness. We think that's a very important part of this uh, issue. If you try to basically get the same information out, distributed information flow, we do that pretty routinely. We call it YouTube. We've got all kinds of methods for social media, for sharing information. So we've got research around effectiveness of that just-in-time training or that distributed training or asynchronous training kind of methods. That'll be a paper that's presented here on Friday, and then this pointed distribution preparedness is another paper that will be presented and break out later uh, this morning. First is we, we looked at the city of Chicago. We got asked to build security plans for the city of Chicago on what happens if an evacuation occurs after a 10 kiloton nuke goes off downtown. We basically built the plans, we built a simulation of those plans, and finally we built about 120 different training modules that built uh, the, the training that was needed for the volunteers that would run reception centers to actually effectively evacuate the downtown area, which would have included about a million people. You can see uh, the modeling uh, and, and also the version of the just-in-time training that we had that was, again, basically YouTube videos that we, we could show you. Modeling of that was fairly interesting. We basically uh, used AnyLogic uh, as a modeling uh, venue. Uh, we took uh, the students uh, in one of those classes I teach basically modeled this environment uh, for the entire evacuation, reception, recovery. Think of the Superdome after Hurricane Katrina. This is essentially the kind of operation we were trying to model that included the staff, the resources, the people that were coming in and the resource and, and the numbers of those people that were coming in and tried to better understand did our plans that were developed by subject matter experts, were they, were they adequate? What we essentially were able to find out, you can see in the combined results, that we looked at total staff and what we were able to do with an agent-based model of, of thousands of agents. We could look at the modeling of resources that were needed in terms of staff, and we determined that the subject matter experts overestimated staff needs in uh, the planning that we did that we thought was good by 25%. Now, why is that a big deal? If you've got to bring people in from outside, you've got to train them, you've got to house them, feed them, do all the management that you need during a disaster, 25% reduction in resources is huge. So basically we were able to show that uh, some of the planning could be done a little bit more efficiently. Some of the safe siting that we might do in some of our planning we, we could better uh, manage. We've run uh, higher education grants to better, imp uh, better planning and emergency planning on our campuses. We figured out how to do that on the Purdue campus and actually taken that, uh, distributed, moved that to another campus. So this kind of planning process that we've been focusing on measuring, how do you measure security on a campus? We figured that out. We've managed to actually translate that to other campuses. Those, it's another important piece that we've determined. The 2012 Super Bowl was an event, uh, you know, a huge event. We're pretty familiar with the Super Bowl, but that happened in Indianapolis, uh, really in our backyard. One of the things that we did at that time is I was working with some colleagues uh, in our institute that were doing social media research. And we used a couple of tools called, one called Visu Visible Technologies, the other one uh, called um, uh, Rating 6. And those two methods uh, were basically a software that were developed for the commercial advertising industry. And the thing that the advertising industry uh, tries to do is prove what's the effectiveness of my $100 million uh, ad campaign uh, so what we did is we got the, that software and we adapted it. The state uh, chief information officer asked us to uh, do this as an experiment, and we sought to find those public safety issues that were part of the 2012 Super Bowl as it was going on in Indianapolis. This was supposed to be a pilot project, a couple of grad students, a couple of reports, and we would basically give them a feasibility study at the back end. A couple weeks before the Super Bowl, we gave them the first report. Everybody liked it so much, uh, they asked if we could do it on a daily basis and basically give them, uh, you know, go much beyond the feasibility and much more into kind of a response study. 
to our four of our students. We said, yeah, you give us a little more money, a little more time, we can do this. And basically every day we uh, use those techniques uh, to try to find those public safety issues. You can see the curve on the side there, the blue line, the light blue, dark blue, and red lines. The light blue line is all the posts, tweets, texts, communications, that social media that were picked up uh, in, th in that case by Radian 6. The blue, the dark blue uh, line that was there in those peaks uh, essentially showed uh, positive uh, things and the red showed negative. And what you're able to do with uh, Radian 6 is you can actually burr into those peaks and determine what were the issues going on. That largest blue peak when Madonna, was when Madonna was announced as the uh, halftime act but you could see there was some negative in there. We actually were able to prove that we could find the human trafficking, we could find other safety issues, we could find places where there were just construction holes that weren't filled in, that people were twisting their ankles and be able to actually allow for actionable data to go back and be used for um, public safety during the event. Next is we took this uh, measurement of uh, security uh, to a number of sporting events. I mentioned the Indianapolis 500. We've also taken it to uh, overseas. We've done this at cricket matches. We've done it at Purdue football and the Indianapolis Pacers. What we've developed is a method that does not interfere with the flow of traffic going into some of these events, but allows us to measure public safety uh, at the point of delivery. We think of TSA at the airports, and sometimes we look at that and say, what the heck are they thinking? It's not done here the way it was there. How come I wait? How come I don't wait? Well, what we did is we basically developed a method that we could measure that process in terms of effectiveness and timing and training and be able to go back and give the decision makers better ideas of where deficiencies were between training and timing and so on. We used uh, any logic again on this to model the agents and the thousands of agents that might be coming into a sporting event and basically use that as a method and tool to better predict the resources that are needed. Think of the Chicago issues and the issues we had recently at TSA. Uh, shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody that those lines built up that when, when things didn't happen uh, as they should based on training and staff, but we're basically able to uh, have a better set of tools now that can go back and measure and determine those staff needs before, determine uh, what training might do if we improve training, improve performance, improve throughput, you know, what kind of outcomes will we see uh, on, on the overall event. Next is we, as a, this was a class project that I started as a class project, and this is uh, active shooter mitigation. So we've seen these Connecticut shootings, a shooting here in Orlando last month, uh, San Bernardino the month before. Uh, af right after the Connecticut shooting, um, I asked students as a class project to try to tell us how we compare some of these active shooter mitigation methods that are out there. We certainly know we can add security to, to schools, and this is where this started. So if we add security to the schools, we do that with a school resource officer. We could also, add, you know, what many would say is bring in concealed carry. Just let me bring my own gun, I'll protect myself and protect those around. Others will say, well, all we need is a locked door and we'll just wait for police. Essentially what we found out is the average police response time in the country is about 10 minutes. The average active shooter before San Bernardino and Orlando was one person was shot every 20 seconds. So we can pretty quickly do the math and say, if we do nothing, we're waiting for police to show up and there's gonna be about 30 casualties. In this case, what we were able to prove, uh, assuming very conservative uh, concealed carry standards and training, uh, that uh, the single greatest thing that we can do uh, to prevent an active shooter or to mitigate the effects of an active shooter is um, to uh, add, a, add, add a security guard. Uh, that brought down casualties by almost 70%. Additions that we could put in were the locked doors, um, the, uh, the concealed carry do further bring down uh, casualties that would be observed. Mentioned the health response to disaster. We did some modeling on pandemic flu and started looking at what kinds of things can we do to um, mitigate pandemic uh, and, and the impact of a pandemic. You think about this from the, some of the some of the folks who were up here talked about defense. And of course, that's uh, defense is part of my experience and background. Uh, Sun Tzu, Clausewitz, lots of classic military thinkers and, and uh, folks would uh, suggest you know, things about how do we maneuver around from the enemy? How do we maneuver from a pandemic that is, uh, you know, an infinitesimally small um, uh, villain that does not necessarily care what we're doing? Uh, so we start looking at the pandemic in terms of uh, how do we maneuver out of the pandemic space? And we basically determined that there were two main actors that uh, we could, actions we could take. First is hand washing, 
and the second is social distancing. Things that we probably all too frequently don't do well. And so we looked at that, developed models uh, basically in the schools and looked at how we might be able to, and, and this model was used uh, using Simulex. Um, uh, one of my Purdue colleagues uh, founded a company that basically had an, another agent-based modeling um, platform. And we were able to show that you can change the 1918 uh, effect of a pandemic both in, from intensity and duration. We could bring the intensity down from about one third of the population getting sick to less than 10%. And we could take the duration from three to six weeks after the flu onset and move it beyond, much beyond that. That's important now because now we've got training, we can come up with other therapies, other methods, and they basically are things that we could do every day. Probably things we learned in kindergarten, wash our hands and stay home when we're sick. Far too little of that probably is happening in a lot of our offices today. How many of us as supervisors punched somebody in the shoulder and said, you know, I know you weren't feeling well today, but way to take one for the team to come in here and try to gut through the problem. We probably should, you know, kind of show them the door and tell them to come back in a couple of days as opposed to coming in and gutting it out. And so just those two simple actions, again, have a huge effect on kind of our public health. We've done some energy security projects, uh, both uh, in workforce development, which I think is pertinent to this particular area, is how do we train and massively uh, uh, overtrain um, the, the individuals that we need to take on uh, information technology, cybersecurity, cyber physical security kinds of threats. Uh, we've done that with several workforce development uh, grants. Um, we've installed you know, electric vehicle charging stations. We've actually developed a learning event for the students, which was an electric vehicle go-kart race. You can imagine Purdue for 50 years has run a go-kart race that was all uh, gasoline operated. As part of one of our grants, we actually electrified that race to try to stimulate the students thinking about uh, electric vehicles, um, really trying to capitalize on what most of us, when we turned 16, we got the finally, or maybe 17 or 18, depending on the state and the age now, but the first time that you got that freedom from your parents is when you got those car keys and got out to go on your own the first time. So we tried to captivate that with the race, get students thinking about that, and actually those electric vehicles um, evolved over time for, for, through several generations. They're now basically production electric vehicles that the students build using uh, you know, the same uh, bus technology that's in the vehicles, and we've actually got a cybersecurity project with General Motors right now trying to look at cybersecurity of that platform to try to improve the learning on the Internet of Things around cybersecurity and vehicles. Um, we've also developed a hybrid g diesel generation project in this energy security kind of area as well. Um, basically, the introduction of a large format battery, like a car battery, with a generator set reduces fuel usage by over 50% in some of these tactical operations uh, for the military, but also could be thought of as emergency power generation in many of our buildings and many of our, our locations around the country. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention a couple of veterans initiatives now, since that, uh, of course, was part of my background, but this is an important resource I want to make sure that everybody understands, and it's one that for the academics, we actually have a strong uh, possibility of improving some of the, the staff and the manpower and the growth that we've got. First is the GI Bill um, basically allows almost every veteran uh, to go back and pursue four more years of higher education depending on the benefits, all paid for by the Veterans Administration. So a huge asset to higher education to try to bring in other paid students that can leave potentially with no student loans. Uh, also a huge uh, benefit basically that we need to provide back to those that have served. We've taken that and gotten a veteran success office at Purdue, but that also evolved into how do we recruit and uh, retain more military officers and do that as part of their duties and, and, and actions at Purdue. So we developed this Purdue Military Research Initiative that essentially is trying to recruit officers to Purdue. Um, I've got two of them that are working for me right now that are both doing cybersecurity projects and persistent cybersecurity projects trying to measure and model a uh, cyber network. So this is a, a huge asset to us across all the services, almost every major in the military or major or lieutenant commander for the Navy. Um, um, they all have master's degrees as they advance. Most of them do them uh, on their own. Many of them will do them fully funded at a place like Purdue or other universities. And what we've done is we've basically uh, done a little bit of Tom Sawyer here painting the fence. We've offered the military free tuition if they give us the officers and allow, them, allow us to do a little bit of matchmaking to guide them towards projects. 
and then essentially what we're able to do is give up a forfeit a small amount of tuition for $120,000 worth of pay and benefits for a fairly uh, or a very ma uh, mature grad student who's able to um, really help us with our research and help us with defense research as we move forward. We've backed that up and got cadet and midshipmen that are coming uh, and working at Purdue doing research projects in the summer. You can see an example of one of the research posters that the uh, one of the West Point cadets did this last summer. Uh, we've also had students even working a few weeks on summer projects from the academies that were able uh, to um, uh, do work on papers and patents. Uh, the um, educational assistance through authentic research we've done at uh, West Point, and this is basically a way of, of t redoing a chemistry class. And instead of looking at the typical principles of the chemistry class, uh, we're, we're able to bring an authentic experience and environment for them to work. So we hope this has got long and short-term benefits for Purdue, uh, for the military, as well as the officer. The military is a very short time frame that they allow officers to leave, and basically we work with them to try to get them done within that time frame. So finally, uh, I'd like to thank you for asking me to speak. Hopefully I've given you some things to think about and some questions uh, for, for the group. Thank you.